1 Corinthians chapter 14. Again, I will have the, the, the words up here uh, so that uh, you um, can follow along. Again, the translation I'm using is, is the uh, ESV on, on the screen. And so uh, um, as you see the title... Order in the church. I uh, kind of picture that, you know, that, that judge in the courtroom. Order in the court. You know, it's like order in the church. And, and so uh, this passage deals with, again, I, I need to put it in context. Uh, the, the context, remember that Paul is dealing with a problem. Uh, that has been occurring. I shared a lot, you know, more details in previous messages of what all was going on. Um, but Corinthians, the Corinthians were constantly in, in, in they were like discovering new ways to show their immaturity. Um, whether it be uh, with their personal relationships with people or when they were with a group gathering uh, in the name of Jesus, they were doing everything but in the name of Jesus. Um, and, um, and, and, and being immature... Um, those who are more immature need more rules. <laughs> they need more rules. Um, uh, you know, children have a lot more rules than maybe when they're of youth age, um, and and then when they become adults, and you know, you know, supposedly you know can make all the decisions on their own. But um, uh, but uh, you know, children, the younger they are, the more rules they need, and and these. This church was acting like, as he would even say, like a bunch of babies um, and how they were. And so after dealing with the issue, he is setting aside saying, hey, you know, we've got to get order here. We've got to, it's gone crazy. And so, so realize this is like not the norm for every church that he's saying all of these other things that we're about to read. Um, but there is general principles to bring over. As a youth pastor, and I can I can remember that far far away. Um, but as a youth pastor, th there'd always be some youth that would find a new way to cause problems. And I would always say, "All right, new rule. <laughs> you know, whatever the issue was, new rule. You know, and it just kind of constantly had to keep adding because you know they'd always find the loophole. And I'd say, "All right, new rule. You know, and, and stuff. I mean, I, I started simple. Just the first rule: don't get hurt. You know. You know. Then I'd have to keep going from that. But uh, and so here's Paul going. All right, here we, you guys, new rule. You know, I don't have to tell the Romans this. I don't have to tell the Ephesians church this. But I am having to tell you, the Corinthian church." This and so what we're looking at is is um, guidelines for a for a worship service or worship gathering for an unruly church. Um, the service had gotten way out of hand, out of control, and, and again, we'll deal a little with it uh, without having to repeat too much from the previous weeks. Again, you can go and watch that online. Um, and so here's two principles that he sets up, one in the, the very first verse as well as at the end, and, and then everything is kind of describing this. So let all things be done for the building of up and building up of the people of the church. So, so whatever you do, it's about building each other up. And so remember that. Um, and then at the very last verse, he says, but all things should be done decently and in order. Again, because when it wasn't done decently or in order, things were going crazy and you'd kind of have a really wild gathering, but nothing, no one was being built up. No one was growing from that. And so, so he sets up some things, some guidelines uh, to, to help. And so, so you know, here's, here's I, I want to I wanna take this. Normally I don't throw, put your blank, I just put your blanks up, but I want to take time, you know, here because just you understand. And so he's talking about an order, okay? Now, uh, again, you know, just, you know, what should should the order be and how should that order be? And so here's the first word, a controlled order, okay? Let's not get out of control. Now, I'm, I'm kind of summing up and then we're going to break it down as we look through these, through these verses that there is some control. There is a, okay, your turn, your turn, your turn, or don't do this or do do that, you know, and, and stuff like that. At the same time, and it's going to sound the opposite, a controlled, spontaneous order. 
Okay, you understand that there's kind of like, okay, I want to control, you know, and all that. But, but, you know, if you let spontaneous things happen, you lose control. And I think that's why we Baptists are very afraid of being spontaneous. It's not in the bulletin. <gasps> you know, oh, well, he did a song that was, you know, well, you know, we kind of, you know, whatever. We messed up somehow this morning. But, but, uh, but you know, hey, if God, if God puts it on, on, on Doug's heart or someone else's, can we sing this song? You know, something like now, again controlled order as well as spontaneous order. And so he kind of brings both together. And, and I'll explain why as we go uh, into to this passage. And so let me pray before we start digging in and then, and then um, we'll, we'll look at this. Jesus, I pray. I pray for the, the gathering here at Kings Creek Baptist Church and that the service reflects you. That the service builds others up, that you receive glory, um, that the, the, the people are, are built up as well as people of different giftedness um, have a part of what is happening here. Whether it be in a, a service or, or some type, a, a worship service or other way of ministry, that each of our giftedness could be a part of this church. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So what is this controlled, spontaneous order? Uh, okay, first of all, um, it should include everyone. Now, when I say it should include everyone, I'm not saying everyone at the same time or not everyone at every service or something like that. But look at Paul's words here. So this is right after he says, okay, here's some guidelines, here's some things, don't let it go out of control or only when it's interpreted, all this other stuff. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn. Uh, some translations have the word psalm, and actually that, that's more correct. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, has a, a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Now, um, and so all of this stuff he, he mentions here, uh, and, and this is why he's mentioning these things. Um, the church had been dominated by one gift. This one gift had overrun this church. It took over, and everything was all happening all at once and stuff like that. So this church had been dominated by one gift. And Paul, in this list that you see here, is, is giving a sampling of a variety of input uh, from the members of the body and is making sure the variety of giftedness is a part of their gatherings, okay? So this list that we just, we just read through, that it says, you know, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, interpretation. It's, not, it's just a sampling. It is not a, you have to include this in every one. It is broader than that, um, you know? And, and so, you know, things not included in that list. Um, exhortation, prayer, Prophecy. We know that that's supposed to be, but that wasn't in the list, you know. And so, so he's just again. Sometimes we get too, you know, into it. Yeah, including these, but this is just Paul saying a sampling of what happens when we gather together. Um, here, here's some other things he mentions. Really, uh, uh, psalms or, or hymns and stuff like that. And it's really one specific word. But but then when you go to Ephesians five, he says, "Speak to one another in psalms." The same word. Hymns, a different word. Spiritual songs, another word. Word. Sing, make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God. So again, this isn't an inclusive list. He's just saying there's a variety of giftedness in the church, and, and I want to make sure that everyone is included by their giftedness in the church. Um, and so it's a, the, this control, spontaneous order, it should include everyone, but it also should edify everyone. And so when we come together and, and one person has a, 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 a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, all, all these other things, um, uh, he goes on and, and says this, um, let all things be done for building up. So, so, you know, let's include more people in the picture uh, of that, but make sure you don't lose this. Let all things be done for the building up. That that is that is primary here, as well as there's a couple other reasons, and, and I'll, this, this verse here will share that. In 1 Peter 4, he says this regarding giftedness. As each has received a gift, 
Use it to serve one another, okay? It's not about this is for me. No, this is for you, okay? My gift should be used for you. Your gift should be used for one another. Um, and so, you know, and so use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various, various grace. By God's grace, he gave you a gift. And again, we can talk about spiritual gifts. We could talk about talents that you've had since you were young. We could talk about a lot of various ways you've been gifted, but he's just saying, Use it to serve one another. And then he goes into to two general areas. Whoever speaks. Now, we can go through the list and, and say the revelation, the prophet, the, the, you know, go down, down the list there, the tongue. Um, you know, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, just saying, God, you know, this is not from me. This is from God to help others serving one another. Whoever serves, another category of all sorts of various gifts. Again, you might not have a gift that, that puts you front and center in, in, this, in this type of setting, but, but man, when, when we get in there and you're in the kitchen and, and no one asks and you're already washing, I mean, you know, just a sorts of gift of service, gifts of, 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 of mercy, gifts, and so many other gifts. We won't go through them all. Um, but, um, and so whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God has supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. And so the, the giftedness should edify everyone, and it should, and this isn't your blank because it wasn't in the primary text, it should glorify God. You know, that that's what we're here for. We're here to edify one another and giving God the glory in all the things that we do. Now, this is the general thing of saying, all right, here, there's, here's your controlled, spontaneous order. You know, that you might, now listen, listen, that might make some of you a little uncomfortable. And I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people who likes to plan ahead and have everything in order and get it all straight. And for someone to come in and say, hey, I'd like to share something. Well, that's not in my program. <laughs> well, I got to get over that. Because maybe God has a word through you for this body. Now, again, that's going to be in a proper order. See me before the service and then tell me about it and then we'll see. So, but I, I really feel that, that, you know, it's not just about what I have to say or what Doug has to say. It's about the body. And then when I was reading this passage, I was going, man, I just, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'd have to let go of control. Yes. So, so anyway, now, and, and again, but you remember, spontaneous, but also controlled. But anyway, we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep talking. So then he goes into specific guidelines, okay? Here's some specific guidelines, okay? Again, when you gather together, and here's, here's a sampling of things that, that happen, and it includes more than one gift dominating service, but you have a variety of gifts that are being used. And then he goes specific guidelines for certain gifts. And the first one is for tongues. Now, again, last week we talked a lot, a lot of what Paul had to say. So we're not going to go into all of that. But, but here it is in the, in the context of a gathering together of believers. There should be a limited number. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three at the most. Okay? So it's like, all right, sorry, we got the third one, number four, sorry, you can't talk. You know, but like, now again, realize that this is Paul talking to an immature church that this particular area went crazy. You know, that it was just like, ah, you know, and just like, you know, no time for the preacher. Um, you know, but, uh, uh, but, you know, so, so he's like, I've got to limit you guys. And not only a limited number, but one at a time. And each in turn. Uh, again, you know, him saying, when the church gathers together, we're not having a free-for-all. We're not having, you're over here doing this, and you're over here doing that. And, you know, it's just like, no, each his turn with, and this, again, was talked a lot about in the verses before this, with interpretation. Let someone interpret. But if there was no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. So in the privacy of your own, then exercise that gift of tongues. But, but in the, if there's not going to be an interpretation, then no. Um, and so he also goes 
into prophecy. Again, the previous verses, again, if you were here last week, he kind of used prophecy as kind of like the symbolic one for all the speaking ones. But for prophecy, a limited number. Okay, same thing. And so it's very interesting. There's actually more rules given for the prophecy part. Let two or three prophets speak, okay? Not a bunch of them, just, you know, again, sorry, you know, only so much at a time, you know. Begin so it didn't overrun the service with this one type of giftedness. Listening with discernment. So they speak, and they're saying, as a prophet, they're saying, this is what God says. You know, God has strongly told me to tell this church this, or what, da, 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 da. that some, just because someone says so doesn't mean it is so. And Paul says, let the others weigh what is said. Let's make sure, is this from the Lord? So listening with discernment. Um, and... Um, uh, go, for limited number, listening with discernment, deferring to others. He, he goes here, and again, he doesn't say this with tongues, but it says, if a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. Now, I don't know exactly what this means because I've never experienced that, but maybe there's something that, that somebody, as that spe person is speaking, going, ah, yes, this is right, or here, let me confirm it, or something like that. You know, I don't know if they raise their hand or, or whatever, but they say, you say, hey, I got something to say, and they, they, they defer and let somebody else. It's not just about you. Um, and again, same thing, one at a time. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and, and all be encouraged, and all be encouraged. Now, um, under the specific guidelines. Again, I've talked, and this is where the control part also comes. Everyone is under control. It, it throws this verse in here, and, and really at first I was like, what is that saying? But then I'm like, yeah, of course that's what it's saying. Um, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, simply this. The spiritual gift is controlled by the gifted. Meaning, if you feel like you got to speak tongues and there's no interpreter, you cannot speak tongues. Or if you feel that there's a prophecy that you have and all that, and it's not appropriate, you cannot speak. And so, this is, so the spirit of the prophet, so, so it's under control. Ecstatic utterances, whether they're in tongues or for our language or in English, where it's just, where everybody's over here and everybody's speaking here and all that, oh, we just can't control ourselves, is what the pagans do. It should reflect God's character. For God is not a God of confusion but of peace. God is a God of, is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Imagine, Doug, if you just continued to sing the song you were going to sing, and everybody else sang the song that was put up on the slide, how would that go over? I mean, you know, some people have a hard enough time doing row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, and then somebody else starts and somebody else picks up and, and doing a round and stuff like that, but it's still the same song and all that. Can you imagine doing two separate songs at the same time? What would it make? A noise. Who would it benefit? Hardly anybody. Like, would you be quiet? I'm trying to sing my song. Now, now, let's just say, all right, let's say we pick 10 songs at the same time to sing all together. Ready? One, two, three. It, it would just be craziness, noise. It should, our worship, our speaking, our, our however our gift in this, it should reflect God's character. And God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Now, again, don't think about peace and quiet. The word peace means wholeness. 
that, that there's a wholeness to it, that there's a, a reason for it, that it's not haphazard. Um, and again, um, so any uncontrolled frenzy is not from the God of peace. But now let me say this. A joyless service is also not from the God of joy. A strict service is not from the God who gives life. I, a lot of people like to jump on this and say, see, we're supposed to do the things in order. Now, there's a spontane, spontaneity of following the Holy Spirit as we do our worship together. And you know what? There should be joy. There should be life in it. Not a deadness. Because we serve a living God. It should reflect God's character. Now, moving on. For God is not a conf God of confusion, but of peace. Now, the e ESV uh, translation, um, as well as the older, probably what's in the hymn book, uh, hymn book the, the pew rack in front of you, the older NIV, um, has it put this way. So as in all the churches of the saints, and it hooks that phrase with the woman should keep quiet. <laughs> Okay, so he's just like saying, all right, this is true. Basically, what that's saying is, 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 you know, yeah, this is across the board and stuff like that. Just about every other translation other than the one we mentioned, and I'll give it in the New American Standard 1995, puts the, as in all the churches of the saints, with what we just read. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Um, again, when, when you look at the original language, there's no punctuation marks and all that, and which one should it go to and stuff like that. And so there is a which one, uh, I, I really think thematically with what it's talking about, it, it, the second one is is more correct in, in, in doing that because it's talking about that. Hey, this is a universal across the board. Um, I, I don't think this coming verses that we're looking is a verse that you can use to say, see, it tells every woman every... Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. So, so, so going through, going down to specific guidelines, I, I needed to say that because, because again, some translations kind of push that. Um, women's public behavior should reflect their submission. Okay, we've already read a passage going through this, this book about that. Now, when you read this, it says, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. Now, this is a troubling verse. Again, I, I, I'll just let you know, I don't think this is one of those verses you can tack on and stuff like that because, because some of the things he's trying to correct and also what he's already said in this book. If we go back to chapter 11, I'm sorry, and if anything they desire to learn, let them, let them ask their husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, you go back to chapter 11, verse 5. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. And you're going, what? You know, I don't remember all the context there, but here's the context. In a public worship, there were women who were not showing their submission, and that's how they did it back then. Not today, but that's how they did it back then. That they showed, um, if they aren't showing their public submission, then they shouldn't be speaking. But if they are, this is the context. In the church service, Praying and prophesying. How can you do that and keep silent? And so I'm just going to say that's a hard question and there's a lot of debate about that back and forth and stuff like that. But I, I need to let you know that, that that is, you know, Paul just gave them permission for the women. If you're showing submission, 
you know, and, and staying and showing submission and how you address, he gives them okay. I'm not saying coming up and teaching from the pulpit. I'm just saying that, that that's there. So women properly submissive participated in the gathering in speaking activities, namely, and, and so we kind of kind of short this list, praying and prophesying. Now, what seems to be addressed, you're like, ah, oh, Randy, you just confused me. Yeah, it's okay. I, I, sometimes after studying, 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 I'm still confused. Um, what seems to be addressed are other verbal outbursts that are happening. Possibly openly questioning a prophecy. That's the immediate context where somebody's a prophet and then somebody can also go, I got something to say too. And somebody might say, yeah, but I'm doing this with discernment. I don't think what he's saying is right. That wasn't appropriate behavior. So Paul's also addressing that same group of women from chapter 11 who could care less about showing submission. And so again, they were probably taking advantage of the open forum to assert themselves. Um, and so again, that probably didn't answer anybody's question on that. <laughs> But I, I wanted to kind of give you, well, here's what it says here, and, and here's what it's saying here. I know God's Word does not contradict its, each other, you know, and, and so there is this. Again, I believe he's addressing a specific situation uh, there in this passage. Now, there are other verses that say, uh, you know, that give uh, definite uh, limitations. But uh, this one, I think, is addressing a specific issue going on, and I could be wrong. Now, I'm going to jump to verse 40, and here's another reason I jumped to verse 40. In some of the documents, the manuscripts of the New Testament, they put the verses about the women after this verse instead of after the verse you see in your Bible. And again, it just means we're not sure to so go here, go here, and all that. It doesn't change the meaning, but, but it, it does kind of let you, you see. But all things should be done decently in order. And then if he talks about the women regarding this decently, openly contradictory, contradictory speech from a woman was shameful. In that culture, and so he's like, you're you're not being decent in or in 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 our time of and and then he says in order, interruptions happening. If you have genuine questions, instead of interrupting, talk to your husband, or talk to an, a, another spiritual person. Again, the older women to the younger women, or in you know speaking to one of the elders. Um, and so he's just saying, so, so again, I, I actually kind of fits better there. Um, but now jumping back up, um, going through, because I don't want us to harp on this one issue other than he's just trying to correct their worship saying, okay, listen, you know, if it's tongues, here's certain orders. If you're doing prophesy, here's certain things. And again, he's addressing issues that were happening. For some of the women, you, you, you just need to be quiet because you're disrupting. And again, I, I think that, that that's kind of more the, the thought that he's saying, not to all of them, uh, but those who were not showing submission. Um, and again, he says, as in the churches of the saints, um, he says this, um, all the other churches follow this pattern of worship. And, and what's the pattern of worship? That, that we're following the character of God. That things are spontaneous, yet they're in control. Um, all the other churches follow this pattern. All the other churches, let me put this, but Corinth... And he's just saying, all the other church, all the other saints, are, are, I don't have to correct. So why not you? Because they thought they knew better. In fact, later on, Paul has to write a whole other letter to this church that's not in existence anymore. Um, uh, and, and, and he called it the sorrowful letter where Paul probably had to lay it out to them. And, and, and even in 2 Corinthians, as you read it, he is still defending his, because they were saying, well, who's, who are you to tell us what to do? I mean, that, that's kind of attitude the Corinthians kind of took toward him. Um, and he says, like, well, what makes you the exception? This is what he's asking. He's saying, listen, listen, all the other churches, are, I don't have a problem with this. Why is it that you do? 
And then he says this, or was it from you that the word of God came? <laughs> Do you have a unique, unique word from God that none of these other churches have? Are you the source of revelation? Uh, are, are, are you the only ones that it's reached? Are you the unique recipients of this revelation that none of the other churches ever got? And then really Paul just lays it on. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or if they think they're spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command from God. That it's not from Paul, this is from God. And if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Oh, what's he saying? If anybody, this is Paul, man, and he's exerting authority that God has given him. If anyone doesn't recognize my authority, Corinthian church, to tell you what is right and what isn't right, and this is off, and this is off, and this is off, and here's how we need to correct it. If anybody's saying, I don't listen to Paul, don't recognize their authority. If anyone does not recognize the authority of what God has said, don't recognize their authority. And in conclusion, he says, So my brothers, eagerly desire. This is, this is a conversation he's had from chapter 12 going into 13 and all of chapter 14. So in conclusion... They earnestly desire to prophesy. Okay, again, and the reason he stated it earlier is because it, it benefits more because they're hearing it in their own language. But then he says something that, that, you know, I mean, it'd be easier if he didn't say this, but he says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Now, he said, now, if there's no interpretation, it's in a public service, no. But he's saying, don't stop. Paul even said, I do it more than you. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. And then he goes again, but all things should be done decently and in order. This passage dealing with the gifts, and I've told you, it's been negative in that Paul is correcting but let's take it into the positive in this. If you're a believer in Christ, God has gifted you. Whether you know how specifically or not, God has gifted you. And wants you to be a part of the body using your gift... Now, again, he had to focus on what was going on here in the service, and, 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 and some of that will carry over in, in, in that maybe God has gifted some of you, and, and you need to talk with me and say, hey, I'd, I'd like to share about, or I'd like to do this, or can I read this verse here? Talk with me about that, because I believe it should reach the breadth of God's people. But then there's a lot of other gifts that people never see. He's given you a gift. He didn't have to give you a gift. Because he's already given the greatest gift. I mean, he gave his son. I mean, he gave his son to, to, to die for us, to rise from the grave for us, because we could not save ourselves. We needed him to save us. And you could say right then and there, God, especially if you recognize your state of sinfulness and, and, and his state of holiness, and you realize what he did to save you, you're going, wow. God, you don't have to do a thing else. God, the rest of my life could be miserable. The rest of my life, I can be sick. The rest of my life, bad things could happen. and Because you don't owe me a thing. In fact, you didn't even owe me Jesus, but you gave him. The, you gave him. But yet, God still does give graciously. 
what will you do? What's to motivate us to use the giftedness as God's given us is that God gave his son. How could I hold anything else in? And so the challenge, God, how have you gifted me? Some of you already know. Some of you might need to go on that journey. So sometimes the journey is this. Well, the pastor said we needed people in nursery. And by the way, we do. Um, I mean, there's people in there, but no more people in there. The less people have to go back there and, you know, repeatedly. Um, and you know what? You might go in there and say, hey, I'll volunteer. I'll help volunteer and all that. And you know what? You might find out right away, that's not my gift. <laughs> You won't know. But if God has gifted you, whether it be talking about a spiritual gift or a talent um, or experience that you've gone through that could comfort those with the comfort you've received, use it. Because God gave us the greatest gift through his son and still gifted us so we could be a gift to others showing Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for what you've given. And that, God, we've been, we've been dealing with someone that needed to be corrected. And, God, you know, we need to hear that. We need to hear so that things don't get out of hand in certain ways and that we really make sure that we are mature and growing and, and that we are about not ourselves but edifying others. And so, God, I pray that the lessons that we've learned, especially in these last couple chapters, um, and that, God, uh, I pray that we would show your character in how we worship, in the things that we say, in the way we say them, in the ways that we serve, <laughs> minister to one another, encouraging, showing mercy, helps. And again, that God, you would receive glory and people would be pointed to your son. And so as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want you to ask, God, would you show me the gift you've given me or the gifts you've given me right now? <laughs> and then here's the next question. God, how do you want me to use them for your body? For some in the room, you're going... You're getting a confirmation. <laughs> you are. For others in the room, you may be getting a, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you follow the Lord's leading in this as we together are the body of Christ to point to Christ our head. Following the service, as always, I will ask if you would like to talk to me about a relationship with Christ, how you can be saved. I'll be up here in the front um, to talk with you. Um, also, maybe you're like, ah, you want to talk about how am I gifted? And if you have questions about that, again, I'll be up here at front um, to help you with that. And so, um, again, Father, lead us to follow you in this area of giftedness, that we would be living for you, Jesus. I pray in your name. Amen.